Sorry. Hey, what's going on, guys? I'm Mike Killer Forty Four here, and today we're gonna do something. I don't know, out of the ordinary. It's ten simple things that are deceptively complex, and when I say simple, I mean simple. I mean really simple. Like it's more simpler. And telling me what this is. Yeah. There are a lot of things in this world that people don't understand because, hey, the world is a confusing place. But we can always take solace in the fact that there are some really simple concepts and ideas out there that we can all understand. However, as it is often the way of lo with life, when you start to look closely at some of these concepts, you realize that you've opened up a giant can of worms. Not really. Number 10, the proof for 1 plus, two, 1 plus 1 equals 2 is 300 pages long. The equation 1 plus 2 is probably the very first bit of math that most of us learned because addition and subtraction are probably the simplest concepts in mathematics. If you have one apple and somebody gives you another, you have two apples. By the same logic, if you have two apples and someone takes away one apple, you only have one apple. It's a universal fact of life that, tra that transcends barriers like language or race, which is what makes the following sentence so unbelievable. The proof for 1 plus 2, 1 plus 1 equals 2, is well over 300 pages long, and it wasn't conclusively proven until the 20th century. As Stephen Fr Stephen Fry explains this handy clip, in this handy clip in the early 20th century, Bertrand Russell wanted to con conclusively prove that mathematics worked, so we decided to start with the simplest concept we know of and went right ahead and proved 1 plus 1 equals 2. However, what sounds like an incredibly simple task actually took the mathematician and philosopher 372 pages of complex sums. The mammoth solution was published as Principia Mathematica across three volumes, which we invite you to read if you aren't planning on doing anything for the next few weeks. That's really, that is, <sighs> my brain would literally explode. Number nine, the definition of almost surely is a mathematical nightmare. If you were to say that given an event was almost sure to happen, how would you explain that to that to a small child? Maybe you say that the event was practic practically guaranteed, but then you have to explain what practically meant in regards to the, that sentence, which word, which word just confused things further, which would just confuse things further, further. It's a tough question because the concept of something being almost sure to happen is so vague in and of itself. Luckily for us, the concept exists within statistical mathematics, which explains it fully. Unlike it's incredibly intimidating at first glance to quote an online math textbook on the concept. In a prob in probability theory, a proper a proper property is said to hold almost surely if it holds for all sample for all sample points, except possibly for some sample points forming a sub subset of a zero probability event. In more basic language, that essentially means that even when an event has a 100% chance of occurring, it won't necessarily occur. For example, if you flip a, flipped a coin a million times, statistically, the odds of the coin landing on it on heads at least once is essentially one. However, there is an in Infinitum, infinitis, infinitis, small chance that the coin could land on tails every single time. So all of the odds, all of the odds of the event happening are for all intents and purpose guaranteed. It is impossible to say that. Number nine, defining the word the is really difficult. The word the is one of the most common words in the English language. It's so you ubiquin, ubiquinitos that all of us have probably never stopped to think about how strange of a word it actually is. As discussed here, it's easily one of the most difficult words to explain to a non-native English speaker because it's such, it has such a massive range of applications, some of which are remarkably odd when looking at objectively. Quote, why do we say I love the ballet, but not I love the cable TV? Why do we say I have the flu, but not I have the headache? 
Why do we say winter is the coldest season and not winter is coldest season? Think about it. We use the word the in dozens of different situations and in reference to many different concepts, ideas, and objects interchangeably. We can use the word the, we can use the word to refer to anything from a specific item to an abstract metaphorical concept, and native speakers can instinctively tell when it's being used incorrectly without thinking about it. As noted in the link in the linked article above, which I'm not going to read, the dictionary itself lists almost two dozen different ways to the word can be used in a sentence correctly, which makes an exact definition of the word that much more difficult to pin down. Don't believe us? Try defining it yourself in the comments and let us know how it goes. This was a video. That's why I said it. I don't know why I just said that, but do it. Do it. Number seven, there's no universally accepted theory on how bikes work. Bicycles have existed for over 100 years, and since they were invented, we've mastered land, sea, and air travel while making impressive headway into space. We have planes that can tra traverse the globe in a matter of hours. So you think that by now we have the humble bicycle just about figured out, but oddly, that's not the case. As mentioned in this article, scientists have been arguing about how exactly they work, or more specifically, how they stay upright, almost since they were first invented. For a long time, the majority, the major theory was, was that the gyroscope force of the wheels spinning kept bikes upright. Well, when scientists built a... Where was I? But when scientists built a special bicycle with contraptions attached to it designed to counteract any gyroscope forces produced by the wheels, it stayed upright and no one could explain how. There are theories that the bike's, the bike's design allows it to steer into a fall and thus correct itself. But they're ju still just theories, and because bicycle dynamics isn't exactly an area of science into which researchers like to invest their time, it's highly unlikely that we'll know for sure anytime soon. Number six. How long is a piece of string? It's impossible to know. Hey, stop scratching. There he is. Yep. I think I just touched his butt. <laughs> if someone was to give you a piece of string and ask you how long it was, you assume that answering them would be a fairly simple. If rather an odd task. If rather an odd task. But how would you answer that person if they wanted to know exactly how long the piece of string was? Sorry. That was something comedian Alan Davies wanted to do with... A certain for a BBC TV special adaptly called How Long is a Piece of String by posing that the deceptively sim simple question to a group of scientists. The answer was uh, rather ironically, it depends. Because the exact definition of how long something is depends on who you ask. Mathematicians told the comedian that a piece of string could theoretically be an infinite length, while physicians told him that due to the nature of subatomic phys physics and the fact that a Atoms can technically be in two places at once. Measuring the string price precisely is impossible. Number five, yawning. That's what I'm going to do when I go to bed. Yawning is a puzzling phenomenon. Even the simple act of talking about it is enough to make someone pe some people do it. Some of you are probably doing it right now. There really is no other bodily function quite like it. Now, some of you reading this may be aware of the long-standing theory that the purpose of yawning is is to keep us alert by forcing our bodies to take in an extra large gulp of oxygen. That makes sense because we're mostly when we because we mostly yawn when we're tired or bored. Situations where an extra burst of energy would come in handy. The thing is, experiments have conclusively disproven that that theory over the years. In fact, there is no universally agreed upon theory for why we actually yawn, even though everyone does it. A commonly accepted theory is that yawning actually cools down the brain, because various experiments experiments have shown that one of the few things to actually change in the body during a yawn is the temperature of the brain itself. Number four. Left and right have been confusing philosophers for years. How would you explain the concept of left and right to someone who had no idea what those words meant? Would you explain in terms of your relative position to a well-known stationary landmark? Or maybe you think outside the box and refer to the rotation of the Earth or something comparably massive and unchanging. But what if you were talking to an, to an alien whose planet rotated differently to our own? 
or one who didn't even have eyes? It's a question that has been intriguing philosophers for years, because without an agreed-upon point of reference, it's incredibly difficult to define what left and right actually are. For example, consider the work of German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who once said, let it be imagined that the first created thing were a human hand, then it must necessarily be either, either a right hand or a left hand. However, with only one hand, it is impossible to explain which hand it is without another one present. Think about it for a second. Right and left hands are cl clearly very different from one another. But if you were to describe them, the descriptions would be literally identical because they're the same. Only they aren't because, as Kant himself put it, a left hand can't fit into a right-handed glove. So there is a difference between them. However said, howe however said differences, difference is practically impossible to put into words without the other hand being present. Number three, we enjoy things for reasons other than enjoyment. Enjoyment is a weird thing because it's so subjective. For every person who loves give a given food, song, or movie, there's another person who adapt, ad adamantly hates it. You think that reason we enjoy things is because it feels good in some way, but scientists have con conclusively proven that that's only half the story. For example, people can be fooled into thinking they love a certain food or wine, just by telling them it's really expensive. The same thing can be said for objects, people who will instinctively choose an expensive product over a cheaper one purely because of the price. Not all people. Enjoyment is barely even a factor. In marketing, this is known as the Chivas Regal effect, named for the Scotch of the for the Scotch of the same name, who, which saw sales explode after they simply raised the price of their product. To further illustrate the point, there's a famous experiment where wine experts were fooled into thinking a cheap bottle of wine was expansional vintage just by switching the labels. Their enjoyment of the product wasn't based on, on the same deeply held love and appreciation of wine. It was based entirely on the fact that they were told it was good wine, which, to be honest, it's much easier. Number two, some mosquitoes bite because bite people because of their clothes. I hope this is not um, mosquito worthy. Really. If you've ever been bitten by a mosquito, chances are someone nearby has given you a recycled explanation for why the insect decided to run your, ruin your day. Maybe they said that you smelled good or that you had a particular blood type. Or maybe they just told you that your shirt makes you look like a victim. Never. We're not being facetious with that list, by the way. They're all things that scientists believe can cause mosquitoes to find you more attractive. As a recent Smithsonian article details, 20% of people seem to be strangely attracted to mosquitoes, and no one is really in agreement as to why. The simple answer would appear to be that it's something in a person's blood that attracts mosquitoes, but how would a mosquito know what kind of blood you have? You have. However, it would appear that the mosquitoes are actually attracted by, chemi by a chemical signal given off the body. It is present in around 85% of us, which also explains why some people seem invisible to mosquitoes, and it indicates what your blood type is. Oh. And number one. Rock, paper, scissors. It's the most serious game in the world. I know, it's confusing. You're just going like... Nothing could be simpler than a game of rock, paper, scissors. It's the easiest way to decide an argument because it's basically just random chance, right? Well, not if the dozens of papers written about the subject are to be believed. The game has become a favorite research topic of psychologists because of how intertwined rock, paper, scissors is with subconscious human responses and game theory. As a result, dozens of strategies exist to help players get an edge in the game, including playing blindfold, blindfolded to avoid being subconsciously influenced by an opponent's body language. Well, that was ten simple things that are deceptively confusing. Or, hold on. Decept deceptively complex. I want to thank you all for watching, and you know the drill. See you in my next video.